everybody. Let's start this technical session seven, computer vision and applications. Uh, let's call the first video of this, this track, a generative approach for face mask removal using audio and appearance. Luis Coelho, Rafael Prats, and William Schwartz from Federal University of Minas Gerais. Please. Hello, I am Luis, and we are from Smart Sense Laboratory in Federal University of Minas Gerais. And I'm going to present the work, a generative approach for face mask removal using audio and appearance. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, the use of facial masks became very common, but their use can be uncomfortable for viewers. And studies show that lip reading is an important communication strategy for those with hearing impairment. Therefore, the use of a mask can harm the speech comprehension for this group of people. This work attempts to artificially remove facial masks from videos, in painting the mask region in a way that the mouth is synced with the sentence being spoken. The method could be applied in image editing to remove masks and even to enable lip reading. The work of Ding et al. removed mask objects in facial images, but it only considers still images and do not use the audio information. While the work of Kumparolis et al. used the audio information to reconstruct talking faces, keeping the lip movement coherent. On the other hand, our work focuses on masked faces and use an intermediate step, the mouth landmarks. Our method is divided in three steps. The first is the mask segmentation, followed by prediction of mouth landmarks, and finally the face reconstruction. Here we have an overview of the method. Once we have the frames with the mask extracted, we combine the face landmarks with the audio feature to predict the mouth landmarks. Then, the complete set of landmarks are used as input of the generative model to guide the shape of the mouth in the impainted output image. As for the first step, the mask segmentation, we use a color-based approach to segment the mask region from the rest of the image. The step 2 is the prediction of mouth landmarks. It has two inputs. The first one is the MFCC audio feature, and the second one is the facial landmarks, except for the mouth. The desired output is the mouth landmarks that match the audio information. We adopted a simple recurrent model with a bidirectional LSTM and a dense layer. Step number three is the face reconstruction. This step receives as input the image to be painted, the predicted mouth landmarks, and a fixed reference image to help the model preserve the subject's appearance. The desired output is the full face image with the mouth shape matching the input landmarks. We use a GAN setup with a model based on the work of Young et al and the generator architecture is inspired on the UNET. To train the generative model, we apply a synthetic mask shadow in the videos of TCD Timid dataset, mimicking a segmented mask region. We propose two novel evaluation metrics to assess the quality of the generated mouth. The first one is the parsing IOU, in which you use a face parsing extractor to obtain three mouth regions and then calculate the mean IOU between the ground truth and the generated image. The second evaluation metric proposed is called disparity. We use a procrust superimposition to align both sets of landmarks and the squared error after the transformation is the disparity. With this metric, we can measure how different are the shapes of the ground truth and generated mouth. We perform ablation and evaluation experiments on both the prediction of mouth landmark step as well as the face reconstruction step, using our proposed metrics and other well-known literature metrics. Table 2 compares some architectures for the prediction of mouth landmarks method, and we perform an ablation of the model inputs, seeing how each input affects each metric. Table 4 shows the evaluation of the face reconstruction step while you're using the ground truth mouth landmarks and the mouth landmarks estimated by the previous step. Table 5 shows how each loss function affects each metric. Here are some sample results from a video of the test partition. In the first row, we have the fixed reference image aligned with the current frame. Next, the masked input, then the generated output and the ground truth frames. 
And here we have a sample video. At the top, there is the original ground truth video, in the middle, the input video with the projected mask, and at the bottom, the generated output for the video. Curiosity and mediocrity seldom coexist. And that's it. Thank you for watching. Well, thank you, Luis. I guess Rafael is present as well for answering the questions. Well, I bring some comments from the reviewers. Uh, anonymous reviewers question. Uh, looks like the UNET L1 loss would be sufficient for this task. Maybe enriched by a stale plus perceptual loss, not usually requiring again. Okay. Using the same architecture. Is well, it true? If so, why using again setup? Good afternoon, Professor Menotti. Thank you for your question. And I agree with you. We employ L1 loss functions with some additional losses, such as style loss function or perceptual loss. And the adversarial loss is one of the additional losses. So yes, it could be removed, but it is a trade-off between training time complexity and some improvement in the evaluation matrix. Okay. So the answer is yes, it could be removed but it is a trade-off. It means you lose a little bit of performance of in the, the evaluation metrics. Yes, we lose That's a little bit point. of performance without using the adversarial loss function. Okay, okay. Well, I have a, a small question. From the output video, it's possible to see that there is a temporal misalignment of the predicted amount, because I guess you are working a still image prediction of, for each image, okay? Uh, how do you believe it's possible to improve such procedure? It's possible to employ some temporal uh, stuff here in the, the mouth track points, something like that, to improve that uh, the effect that I perceive it. Well, yes, I agree with you. There is some jitter in the video. And there are some techniques that might be applied in future works to try to solve that. For example, we could try to incorporate uh, some kind of recurrent recurrency in the generator, yes. such as an LSTM, for example, is one of the ideas. And some works in the literature use a, a sequence discriminator, a discriminator that tries to verify if two images are from the same sequence. Okay. It's also another idea to, to improve the jitter problem. Thank you, Luis. Uh, I guess we don't have any more questions. So thank you again, Luis. And if you have more, opa, Claudio has arrived. I don't know if he has another question. Well, uh, let's move for the next presentation. If you want to discuss something uh, with uh, Luis Coelho and also with uh, Rafael Prats, you can uh, send some messages in the Discord, okay? Well, now, uh, the next presenter is Hannah Menezes. He will present the work entitled Bias and Fairness in Face, uh, face Detection. Um, the other author, authors are Arthur, that is here as well for, for answering questions, Ines and Professor Herman from Federal University of Campina Grande, okay? Thank you. Please play this paper the reports the existence of bias and unfairness in face detection. Face detection is the first step for any system that processes face images. Therefore, if there is bias or unfairness in this step, all the processes steps that follow may be compromised. To conduct this study, we use the casual conversation dataset from Facebook AI to analyze five face detectors and investigate the presence of bias and unfairness in their results. Only detectors that have their implementation publicly available were used in this study. They were Dual Short Face Detector, Pyramid Box, Retina Face, Light and Fast Face, and the Multitask Cascade Convolutional Network. The main selection criteria was the time spent for inference, and the all detectors were used pre-training models. In this picture, we observe two frames analyzed by the, D the LFD model. The frame on the left, a female wished the face was not detected, 
and the frame on the right, a male person which the face was detected. Some of the metrics used to identify the existence of bias and unfairness involved the verification demographic part, verification existence of false positive and or false negatives, equal opportunity, and verification equalize the odds. Mathematically, demographic part requires a predictor by satisfied demographic part independently of the protected class A. The equal opportunity requires the positive result to be independent of the protected class A conditioned to a real positive Y. The equalized odd requires the positive result to be independent of the protected class A conditioned to a real number Y. In the flow chart, we present the proposed methodology, which comprise data extraction and preparation, face detection using the SLAP approach, estimation of the face detection statistics, and analysis of bias and unfairness based on the detector's results. In the analysis stage, we investigate the levels of disparity and the equity. In the levels of disparity, the color in the graphic is based on the magnitude of the absolute metric. Dark color indicates a higher rate. We observe that, the, that for false negative rate for MTCNN and the retina phase, the male gender has the higher risk of incorrect detection. To predict the positive rate for all detectors, the age group 3, skin tone 4, and female gender are positively predicted more frequently. The single observed difference was the MTC and N detector that obtained a predicted positive rate higher than the other detectors for the female gender. In the levels of equity, the colors are based on the fairness determination for each attribute group. Green equals true and the red equals false. We observe that the false negative rate for male gender and the skin tone groups 1, 3, and 4 were considered unfair for MTC and N detector. The predicted positive rate for three phase detectors, retina phase, pyramid box, and the DSFD, the female gender, age group 3, and the skin tone 4, received fair detections. However, those are the reference group, and this show that the model are not fair in terms of statistical parity with any one of the other groups. Only MTC and N detector were considered not fair for skin tones 5 and, and 1. The conclusion were considered the analyzing metric on can infer that the detector presents some type of unfairness in their result related to at least one group of attributes. The most common attribute that present unfair result were skin tone and age. The detector mtc -NN has presented the higher risk of incorrect detection, and the DSFD is smaller risk of incorrect detection. Thanks so much for your attention. Oh, thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Arthur. Not Arthur. Okay. Yes, I have two questions, and also I had stolen from a question from the from a reviewer, two reviewers indeed. Okay. Well, the first one is this is a comment. It's a nice, interesting approach in work. And it's not usual this kind of comparison of uh, uh, methods, but it's very interesting in my opinion. So the first question that I have for you is to you guys is how can you address the bias issue in the Brazilian context? How do you believe we can do that? Because we are a country very multiracial, I'll say we have a lot of uh, difference. And how can you imagine that? How can how you figure it out on making that? So in good afternoon. So in Brazilian, the context of bias and unfairness 
is very difficult analyze because it are multicultural uh, and the uh, it is very is very difficult and um, I believe how to that deal with that I, I don't understand that. how to deal with this problem the ideas how do you imagine some okay. guess <laughs> <Kick -siash. laughs> I believe that the difficult is how to how can I say um, investigate or how can I say lidar <laughs> coins to deal with really this problem is very difficult <laughs> okay okay well let's move for the next question from Camila Laranjeira please did you measure skin prototypes or was it provided by the database? Did you measure the skin prototype or was it provided by the database? This information, the skin prototype, it was in the database or have you had uh, measure it? Now, the, the skin type and the, the old attributes uh, the division is present in the database from okay. the Facebook AI. Okay, thank you. Well, now a question from Professor Claudio Jung. Do you think that all faces are equally easy or difficult to detect? I don't see here. Uh, do you think that all faces are equally easy? Elas são fáceis do mesmo jeito ou mais difíceis de detectar? No, Is there depends. any kind of difference? It depends. Okay. Depend. Depend the conditions of light, the ambient, depend the angle, the né, recognize the face. Is the very generous for analysis. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, uh, another question from um, two reviewers is: What motivation the division of the age groups into three groups? Okay. The first one, it's okay, but the last one is from. Uh, 14, uh, 46 to 85, okay? I'm almost there, and uh, we have a lot of changes in, in these groups. Why why not another division or more subgroups here? Can you justify, can you elaborate on, on that? Please. So we, we adopted the, the same age range present in the data set to easily reproduce. Lee. And moreover, uh, those age range probably leads a, a balanced distribution with uh, is also for the most attributes combinations. Okay, okay, okay. It's a data imbalancing problem. Okay, thank you. Well, another question from Professor Claudio Jung. Uh, to be more clear, uh, the question regarding uh, faces. Uh, do you think that gender or skin color are the only factor that impact face, face detection? Skin and gender are the most important, okay? This is your conclusion, but there is another, there is uh, other uh, factors. Yes, the, uh, we observe the, detect, the detector, the face for female gender from the four, for the five uh, detectors available has the higher risk for incorrect detection too. Yes. Uh, another question from Professor Jung. Uh, can you have other kind of biases, such as illumination background? Uh, I don't uh, understand. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, there ahead. is actually um, the database, there is also in the metadata. Um, uh, about if the video has a good or bad illumination, but we didn't take that in account to um, select the videos. It was um, a random choice, um, a pickup, let's say, for okay. the videos. But there is also this point. Yeah, yeah. Camila is telling that uh, it's not only about the difficult, it's about protected classes. Uh, since the research focus is fairness in detection. Okay, okay. Camila, do you want to add something here? Let's wait uh, 
few seconds because there is a delay between the presentation and the YouTube. Oh, thank you, Claudio, anyway. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Ar Ar Arthur. And send a hug to <laughs> Professor Hammer. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Let's move thank to the another. Much. Welcome. Let's move to the, ne to the next presentation. Well, now we have SCAT, Semantic Gap Graph Attention for Three Human Pose Estimation. Please play the video. It's a work Hello, from... Hello, I am Luis Schirmer, and in this paper, we are to do, we introduce the Semantic Graph Attention for 3D Human Pose Estimation. Pose Estimation is a challenge task in many real applications. Pose Estimation means that if we have an image of a person, this technique has as output the 2D or the 3D skeleton of this person. This can be used in many real-time applications related to medical analysis, retail, robotics, and many others. When we consider motion capture for computer animation, most techniques need sophisticated frameworks and expensive equipment inaccessible to most producers. To solve this problem, we propose a lightweight method based on deep neural networks without the need of any specialized hardware. Pose in this paper a novel gate mechanism applied to semantic graph convolutions for 3D applications, named semantic graph attention. Semantic graph convolutions learn to capture semantic information such as local and global node relationships, not explicit, represented presented in graphs. We improved the performance by proposing an attention block to explore channel-wise interdependencies. The proposed method performs the unprojection of 2D points onto their 3D version. We use it to estimate 3D human poses from 2D images. Both 2D and 3D poses can be represented as structured graphs, exploring their particularities, particularities in this context. Then, for our model of, of the neural network to estimate 3D key points, we have two internal blocks that use the semantic graph structures, followed by an attention block. Also, at the end of the internal block, we also have a residual operation to improve the accuracy. We test our model in two large datasets, the Human 3.6 and the MPI. The attention layer improves the accuracy of the skeleton estimation by 58% fewer parameters by using 58 fewer parameters than the state of the art. And also, our technique outperforms the state of the art by 12%, considering the mean per joint position error. This is an example of our technique for 3D pose estimation applied to computer animation. Here, convolutional pose on a machine detects the 2D key points and we use this data as input to our 3D pose estimation, our 3D model for pose estimation. As you can see, our results are competitive considering state-of-the-art and many other approaches. Here we have a second example of our full pipeline. We have uh, an image just as input. We use a 2D neural network to detect the 2D key points. Our 3D neural network based on graph attention convolutions and, and graph convolutions generate the 3D key points, and we create a final uh, animation in an open source animation suite. Present a novel model for attention layers in semantic graph convolutions. With our approach, we built a lightweight 3D human pose estimation model, project 3D key points from the output of a convolutional pose machine in the 3D space. Our model can be seen 
has a number projection for 2D to 2D to 3D key points. The combination of semantic graph convolutions and ancient layers improves the performance and reduces the overall complexity of our model and achieves state of the art performance with 58 fewer parameters. However, the prediction quality depends on the 2D inputs. If a 2D predictor fails in general, generating the correct input data, our model will also fail to regress the data. Since this method is, uses, uses a small set of parameters, we intend to adapt it to applications in edge devices as a future, year, future works. We believe that our post estimation model can be handy for people to easily create 3D animations without any specialized hardware. Thank you. Well, thanks for the presentation. Uh, Luis, and see also that Helio Cortez is also here. Hi, Helio. Uh, Enio is also there. It's nice to see you guys like that. Uh, we have some questions. The first one is from the, a reviewer. Uh, better and recent data augmentation approach could be used together with the proposed path. Yes, for sure. However, in, in our paper, we just focus on our new layer. Um, the semantic graph attention. So we use um, these data sets just to validate our technique, just to show the power of this attention layer. Okay. Oh, thank you. Let me see. We have another question. I don't know if can you no no. Uh, the first question is from how the next question. How Almeida? Thank you. How your model has a lot of less parameters than other works. How does yeah. that reflect the network's real-time input processing speed? This is a very good question. Uh, in our paper, we focus on applications for real-time. So this is the main focus of uh, another project where we, we use this technique. So it reduced uh, by three times the, the time to process this attention three layer. Times faster. Yeah, two times faster. Consider just the 3D part. Yeah, yeah, and the visualization, visualization results that you show, it's very interesting. Yeah. Visualization is, is cool. Okay, Thank well, next, next question. Uh, Claudio Jung, uh, a curiosity. Does it work if you look at the back of a person? Oh, yes, uh, this is another good question. Uh, our uh, 3D model depends from the 2D input. So if our 2D detector fails, our 3D um, model will fail too. So we, depends from the 2D data. Detection. Okay. The 2D detection provider, yes. Okay, it's fine, I guess. Another question from Raul Almeida. What changes do you judge necessary in order to successfully apply this model to the task of multi-person post estimation in terms of computational complexity? Uh, multi-person. Okay. Yeah, um, there is a lot of papers focused on these tasks. However, we didn't explore for multi-person in 3D. Uh, for multi-person post estimation, I know that there is a lot of papers related to yeah. top-down and bottom-up detection. But however, we didn't explore in the 3D context here. Okay, okay, okay. Well, thank you, Luis. Thank you, Raul, as well, for another uh, another question. And uh, well, uh, we have two another, um, another question here from Tiago Novello. How about dog pose estimation? <laughs> It's possible to apply that for a dog's pose estimation. I think it's possible if you have and then annotated data and the to the detection, maybe it would be possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, people, if we don't have any more questions, you can continue uh, the dis a discussion with Luis on the Discord channel of this session. And let's thank uh, Luis. Thank you, Luis, for the presentation. Thank you, thank you guys, for the presentation. Well, we have to move for the next presentation. Well, we will start now with the presentation from Peru. Uh, TVA Net, a spatial and feature-based attention model for self-driving car from Victor 
Flores Benites, Universidade Católica de São Pablo, Carlos Mugruza, perdão, aqui, Vassalo, e Hansel Mora Koch, também da Católica University, Universidade Católica de São Pablo, Peru. O segundo autor, o segundo autor vem from a universe from Lima, I forgot, sorry. Uh, please, play the video. Hi, my name is Victor, a candidate for master's degree at the Universidad Católica San Pablo. I'm going to present TV INET, a special and feature-based attention model for self-driving car. Self-driving car is a vehicle able to drive on road with little or human intervention in a safe manner. To achieve that, the driving model should efficiently exploit the experience in the datasets, as well as build optimal representation of the environment and the state of the vehicle. For this challenge, we propose a training algorithm and self-driving model. The first pretty sample addresses the problem of no identically distributed data. The second approach, the visual attention model, is the most important in our research. The main idea is to select relevant information from the complex driving environment by means of the attentional mechanisms. We call our model TVNet and it is based on the theory of visual attention or TVA. TBA is a theory in neuroscience which proposes a mathematical formulation of attention. The visual inputs objects are encoded by the visual system. Then these compete to be encoded in the visual short-term memory or VSDM. This competition is biased by attentional weights of obvious and visual categories. Visual categories are properties of the objects, some of which are relevant to higher processing in the brain. Three equations are defined in TBA. The first rate equation estimates the encoding rate in visual short-term memory. The second weight equation estimates the attentional weights of the objects. The third equation estimates the perceptual bias of the visual categories. From this theory, we propose an interpretation for artificial intelligence. We define a category as a direction vector in Latin space, which expresses a meaning. Therefore, the sensory evidence of a category in a visual encoding is equal to the projector of the encoding onto the direction vector of the category. Based on this definition, we reformulate the weight and perceptual bias equation. Based on our interpretation of TV8, we propose our model for self-driving. Our proposal uses two attention mechanisms. The feature selection mechanism emphasizes feature relevance to the current driving task, defined by CT. From this computation, the spatial selection mechanism emphasizes regions of the visual input have relevant features. However, a model guided only by this mechanism might have an important drawback. It would not be able to recognize a new relevant element in the scene that is different from the previous node elements. We solve this problem by introducing a button up input guided only by the sensory strength of the input implementation. The general framework is present below. We use an LSTM to capture vehicle dynamics information. Our architecture computes spatial radar and its feature relevance to two driving subtasks, steering angle control and velocity control. The implementation of our attention model is inspired by the self attention framework. We compute a feature attention map for each task. Then, the selected features are used to obtain special attention maps for each task. Our second contribution is the training algorithm, Priority Sampling. The main idea is prioritize the training of unknown samples for the model. That is, higher probability is assigned to the samples with higher loss. This idea was originally proposed by Scholl for transformer learning. However, sampling based only on training loss prioritizes on layers in the data set. As a result, the network may forget to solve simple problems that are common. We solve this problem by incentivizing the exploration in the data set with UCT. Through this compensation, samples with high loss will have a lower sampling probability if they are selected many times. However, pretty sampling introduces a bias changing the solution to training convergence. To address the problem, Schultz use important sampling weights, which is calculated with this equation. Results First, we evaluate pretty sampling. We know this an improvement of all the approaches we studied. We compare our proposal with King's model with outperformance 
it in loss values, then we evaluate additional term in the percentile bias and the use of these integral features. In both cases, our proposal is superior in performance. Finally, we compare two definitions of the magnitude of sensory gradients of a features. The results show that the difference in performance between the definition is minimal. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for the presentation, Victor. Uh, we have some questions here. The first one from Israel Chaparro Cruz. In, this, in the paper, you mentioned that features with high similarity had a bias to the selection of features. Why is this happening? Uh, yeah, so this is due to the dog products. So when there is a subset of features with no zero similarity, the selection of the features creates a uh, base over to the whole subset since, uh, since <laughs> the dot product is no, not zero. That is a problem in our model because it breaks out uh, uh, our assumption that feature selection is independent. Okay, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I have I have another question from Anonymous Reviewers with why there. Besides the exciting results, I felt that the authors did not completely evaluate the spatial attention modeling. I understand I understand the difference between self-attention and their model. However, did the author's evaluation evaluate attention augmented convolutions? against their proposal, specifically uh, attention augmented convolutions. OK, for the first part, so mm, in a paper, we represent some examples, so, so, some some situations. Uh, Fields are uh, falling late, <laughs> um, uh, to right, to, to left, uh, some critical situation for uh, recognized uh, cars. Um, but maybe the the review, reviewer is they want to we present uh, co compare when when use a special attention when when without special attention. <clears throat> so in, in this paper we not put this <laughs> this experiment. So, but okay. see for for space. Have you had a, a, a comparison? <laughs> See, so, yeah, so yeah. space. Uh, so the another question is about uh, uh, some paper. This is a uh, channel attention. If I don't know, well. okay. so this is this is another is, is uh, another approach. So the general idea is uh, is controlate the the dimensions. So uh, so for example, say. Uh, the input is a circle, so okay. uh, this uh, uh, in Latin space is a circle. <laughs> so uh, this approach is, uh, uh, eliminates or compresses uh, some direction. So in this direction is not relevant. In this direction is more relevant. This is the general idea. So eliminate some di some dimension. But in our on propose, we select uh, some features. So we select some information is relevant to the self, self driving task. Uh, another question, combine. OK, let's move to the next question. Uh, the intuition to combine spatial and feature attention looks pretty similar, OK? Let's consider critical situations. How can the authors measure by bias problems? Just uh, suggesting that the data set may be responsible for some errors may not be sufficient. Sufficient. Yeah, this is a good, uh, good question for the reviewer. So uh, we notice uh, some problem with uh, light traffic. So in some cases we don't recognize uh, the light traffic. So we we suggest uh, this is because the the data sets the data sets is limited. So in our paper is <laughs> is a limitation. So in, that is next work we prove in in benchmark. In Berchmann's, Carla Berchmann, this is a uh, driving. This is an important, a very important class, no? Like, it's, yeah, this uh, is very important. Because so, it's imbalanced, that the region is small, which is the, so, the reason. The, the, the problem is, in some cases, in the data set, the, the cars omit the, the, light, the lights the traffic. 
that this is our problem for uh, for training. Oh, wow. So now we training in Carla uh, 100. In, the, in this case, it's a larger data yeah. set. See, it's another. It's a larger data set. So okay. now we are going to group in benchmark the of Carla. Okay. Okay. Let's move to the last question. And so far, did you test your proposal in another application? So yes. Oh, Sophia, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my research groups is using the model in background subtractions. So the general idea is extract to the background in a video. So in this case, the whole video is a context for the task. So my our proposal using a, a context in, in this case is all video. So we we okay. create a representation for the video. So Just looking for the, uh, the objects from interest. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Select uh, spatial Select regions and, and features. So in general, uh, I think our, our proposal is oriented to navigation. So we would would like to test or another or approach in reinforcement learning in the futures. Ah. But simil another and similar to, to the approach of, of my research group, I guess I our model can be used in future learning. So that's this is another that we will be explored in my research group. Okay. So in general our proposal is, is based in basic processing, visual process, processing brain. So maybe uh, or proposal can be used in many many computer vision topics. Okay. So as long as context can be defi defined. Yeah. So, but another... I guess for, for self-driving cars, the background is changing every time. No, it's difficult to follow that. Yeah. And but, where so, in another situations where the camera is fixed at in a point, I guess it's it's very interesting to use this kind of yeah. So the model is is based in uh, based on <laughs> is. The, a model for brains, so maybe it can can use in another topic. So, and the another approach in, in our paper is a great example is a algorithm training. So this is for unbalanced data. So I have I've test in segmentation and works very good. So maybe we uh, you, <laughs> we use uh, in another topic so now. Okay. Okay, thank you, Victor. Thank you very much. Uh, well, if you have more questions, you can continue a discussion with Victor on the Discord channel of TS7 Technical Session 7. Well, let's move for the next presentation and send a hug to Professor Yu uh, Hansel. Well, a vision based solution for track misaligning detection. Present from a colleague, Cotes War Rao Giri Potula. Thank, sorry for the pronunciation. Please play the video. Hello, everyone. This is Koteshwar from IIIT Delhi presenting our work titled A Vision Based Solution for Track Misalignment Detection. We consider two types of misalignments, lateral and vertical. Lateral misalignment can happen due to buckling phenomena where a longitudinal compressive stress develops due to difference in temperature from what is considered normal. The vertical misalignments can happen due to hogging, uh, in hogging, the ends of the railway tracks where they join, uh, there a bend happens, for, as you can see in this figure. And when railway wheels pass on such bends, that causes jump, a small jump for them. And when they land on the remaining portions of the railway tracks, Further jumps, further dips happen, and which leads into uh, vertical misalignments. So, to detect this visually, we uh, collect several images from 
uh, internet comprising of these defects and also few normal ones. And this is the data set we have. And we collect about 555 images and uh, around 20% images were dedicated for testing purpose. In the transfer learning approach, which we take based on these images, uh, we have two sets of two, two hyperparameters. One is the PT network itself we use for feature extraction and the learning algorithm we use for learning the model. Now, we have options for these hyperparameters. As we tune our hyperparameters over these options, we need to select the accurate, precise model. So to model the accuracy, uh, we take into account training and validation accuracy. And we have this term, which is bias-like. And uh, more the training and validation accuracy, we get this bias error as very low. And uh, then we have variance-like term, uh, lesser the difference between training and validation accuracy, the, the term becomes very low. And these two errors need to be jointly minimized. And when we are minimizing, we have uh, different weights for these errors. Uh, and these weights need to be in the range of zero to one. And when we are trying to minimize this, this portion plays do, doesn't play any role in minimization. And if we are trying to minimize this, it means we want to maximize the negative of this exponent, which we uh, denote as x. And uh, as we are trying to maximize x, uh, we, if we want to have uh, the same range as v and t, alpha, this term, this uh, coefficient and this coefficient should uh, sum into one. To have their sum as one, uh, alpha needs to be half. And if we, we can get half, we can get alpha like this, but still beta remains. And beta is, uh, is an application dependent hyperparameter because beta denotes the variance parameter and depending on variance, uh, wait for variance term. And depending upon the variance that exists in the images, we can set our uh, beta. Now, uh, x, we, we select those models with x, uh, having x, which is greater than certain threshold. And this threshold is determined by the average and standard deviation of all the x values we got for all the models we uh, considered. And these are the results which we get for all the models we tried out. Their training and validation accuracy is given and their, uh, their X value is given. We select seven models based on that criteria. And uh, we, we see that their test accuracies are also very high. Uh, however, we did miss few, uh, few, few of these red ones. Um, we, we, we say they, we have missed them because their accuracy is higher than average of uh, the accuracies we get for our selected models. These are few images which got uh, classified as defective correctly. And these are images which got classified correctly as normal ones. Uh, in, while concluding, we would like to point out that we uh, try to detect misalignments, both horizontal and vertical. And then we try to uh, develop, we try to identify those transfer learning models, which are uh, both accurate and precise. And uh, we select few good ones. And out of those good ones, we found out that inception B3 plus uh, NN was the best as, uh, as you can see from our test table. Thank you so much. If you do have any questions, please ask us. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kutsuar.
Uh, it's a very interesting and important application on the highways. Uh, here in Brazil, we have to use more rails. Uh, well, we have a first question from Professor Dr. Jung. Uh, is it possible to first detect the track rails left and right and then identify the facts? Okay. In this project, what we are doing, we are taking the track image and we are trying to classify it. Yes, it is possible if we are able to segment the tracks. We haven't yet tried semantic segmentation problem. If we do that, then yes, it will help us. Okay. Uh, well, uh, this database was, was building only selected images from the internet. Yeah, we collected it from internet. Okay. Do you have some kind of uh, contact with uh, railways from India? No. No, not at all. Yeah, because here in Brazil, we are the the railway companies are becoming closing from the universe, and a uh, uh, very important stuff. They have a lot of. Yeah, we want to use them. this. We want to use this research work and approach our government that we have this solution which uh, we have already results for, and then we will seek funding on that. That's the okay. plan. Because I, I'm aware that GE, a uh, very large company, is working on this subject. And uh, this is very important because when a uh, train crashes, uh, the time and money is paid mm -hmm. to, to put the things on, on the track, it's, it's huge. We don't have yeah. idea of how much money uh, train costs for the for the country okay right uh, we have another uh, question from professor claudio Jung. thank you professor is the capture setup standard standardized if you have a top down view will it work it means uh i guess he's asking if you can have a zenithal view from the the camera is that claudio uh there is no standard for capture because you had to use this image from the internet, okay? Is this yeah. The so when we were collecting the internet from when we are collecting images from the internet, we cropped the images in such a way that uh, it it is as close as possible to the scenario where we are viewing the track. Okay, uh, Claudio is asking if we we use a drone for for making a move for filming. Yeah, you're talking about drone. Yeah, yeah, using yeah, a drone. Yeah, drone is a good idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, it's interesting. Uh, do you have more questions? I don't know if I have another one. I guess I, once you have the, the, the application, you also have some contributions to the transfer learn. Okay, yeah. wow. Thank you for the submission. We, we, we advise, not advise, we'll ask you to submit again for CBGRAP in the next year yeah. and hope to come to Brazil for president yeah. and to, to, to know the country. Okay. Sure. Thank you for the presentation. And if we don't have more questions, you can also uh, continue discussion, a discussion with, prof, uh, with Professor Cotuswar on the Discord channel. And thank you for watching this uh, technical session. Uh, coming next, Keynote 6, it's a shared uh, Keynote from other, con from other conference. Uh, Maggie say Al Nassar, uh, soon at uh, 3 p.m., okay? Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. See you.